And Chief, if you think we're at a good time here, I'm happy to get underway. All right, good evening and welcome to the City of Piedmont's second Police Call Data Analysis Community Meeting. The purpose of this meeting is to provide an update and take questions on the ongoing analysis of police call data, which was approved by the City Council in July 2021. I'm Assistant City Administrator, City Clerk, John Tulloch, and I'll be the moderator for tonight's meeting. We are recording this meeting and we'll make it available for later viewing. The meeting will begin with opening remarks from Police Chief Jeremy Bowers, then Professors Michael Smith, and Robert Tillier of the University of Texas San Antonio will give a presentation describing the status of this research project. Once the presentation is over, questions from the community will be answered. Because of the large amount of interest in this issue, we're asking community members to submit questions in writing via the Q&A feature of Zoom. Click on the Q&A icon in Zoom and type your questions in. If you'd like to ask anonymously, click the check mark next to the text send anonymously before sending your comment. I will review the submissions, group similar topics together, and post them to the panel. We can't promise we'll get to every question asked, but we'll do our best in the time allotted. And with that, I'd like to invite Chief Bowers to give his opening remarks. All right, thank you so much, John. I appreciate it, um, as always. And good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Jeremy Bowers, and I am the Chief of Police for the Piedmont Police Department. Um, so to begin with, on July 19th, 2021, the City Council approved an agreement with the University of Texas San Antonio to conduct um, analysis and analysis of calls for service, which police officers respond to, and to determine the frequency of potentially bias-based calls from the public, which lack specific criminal-related behavior as a basis for police intervention. Police and resource deployment is a topic uh, that is garnering much attention and discussion throughout the country. Uh, my goal, our goal with this call data project is to obtain facts and data to help in our ongoing community conversation about policing locally. Um, I'm happy to introduce tonight, uh, Dr. Michael Smith and Dr. Rob Tillier of the University of Texas San Antonio. I just wanna take a couple moments to just talk a little bit about them and their background. Uh, the University of Texas San Antonio's criminal, criminology and criminal justice faculty are nationally recognized for their scholarship and are committed to innovative research. With expertise in a variety of areas, UTSA brings substantial uh, quantitative and qualitative methodologies, criminal, criminological, excuse me, criminological and criminal justice system theories, and substantive expertise in policing, courts, and corrections. Dr. Smith is, nationally recognized, is a nationally recognized expert on racial profiling, and his other areas of focus include racial, ethnic disparities in policing, police use of force, and police law and public policy. In addition to his responsibilities as Associate Dean for Graduate Student Success at UTSA, Dr. Tillier's research has focused on criminal justice system decision-making, victimization, and crime prevention in criminal events. Uh, before I conclude and hand things off to Dr. Smith and Dr. Tillier, um, I want to thank uh, those who have joined us tonight and those who make the time to watch the recording going forward. And I also want to um, introduce and say thank you to Commander Lisa Douglas, who has also joined us on the panel this evening, um, who has been instrumental in facilitating um, a, a very, uh, um, at times, challenging time of extracting data and really partnering um, with um, um, both our researchers, Dr. Smith, Dr. Tillier, um, and, and our, our vendors. So um, thank you, Commander Douglas, for all your work in this project as well. And uh, with that, um, I will turn it over to um, Dr. Smith and Dr. Tillier. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Bowers, and good evening, everyone. It's good to be with you from um, San Antonio, Texas. That's one of our beautiful buildings on our downtown campus behind me. Uh, I'm here with my colleague, Rob Tillier, and we're gonna provide a, a brief update for you this evening on where things stand with our project, and then take any questions that you might have. Um, you may know, or you may recall that we were in Piedmont in the fall. We conducted um, some focus groups with the community. We also met with city stakeholders, 
get an idea of, of what uh, what folks were looking for uh, from this project and to and to just sort of get to know the city of Piedmont a bit. And we will be back at the end uh, to present our findings and to to meet with the community uh, and city leaders as well. So with that, let me uh, let me jump in. Um, with our, we have a we have a PowerPoint that I'll I'll run through for you that will give you a sense for where things stand. So I'm going to share my screen. Give me just a second. There we go. Can everyone see that? Okay. This is the Piedmont Police Department called data study. As Chief Bowers indicated, we became involved in the summer of of last year of 2021 and uh, negotiated a scope of work with the city, engaged, uh, entered into a contract with the city uh, and began our work in the late summer and into the fall and it continues to, to, to today. As a reminder or maybe a refresher for some of you who may have been involved or sat through our earlier presentation in the fall, our, we have two primary goals here with our project. Um, and they make use of two um, unique and different sorts of uh, buckets of information. The first primary goal is to analyze calls for service from the Piedmont Police Department's uh, CAD system or their com computer-aided dispatch system. This is the system that houses all of the 911 data and other non-emergency call data that are generated when someone calls, um, calls the police. We have five years worth of those data um, and we have been engaged to help the city understand how that understand its call data how those calls come in what kinds of calls are the most frequent uh, what kind of police resources are used to respond to those calls um, and to make some data-driven recommendations to the city about this question that, as Chief Bowers mentioned, is on the minds of many communities uh, today, which is, um, you know, do we need the police all the time? Do we send the police to calls that perhaps um, others might be better suited or to, to respond to, or, or should we send the police you know, along with um, other, other kinds of professionals? And these are the, again, these are the kinds of questions that many communities are wrestling with. We did a similar analysis, for example, right here in San Antonio uh, back in the fall. Um, so that's that's uh, our first goal is to inform the city um, about its own calls. And this is a frequently a, an issue um, where lots of call data are collected and often um, and, and they're oftentimes not not analyzed or there's not a real deep understanding in um, of, of how those how those calls are actually distributed. And so that's that's why we're here and that's our, our goal, uh, our first uh, primary goal here for, for the project. And we'll, we will, when we're finished, we will, um, we will prepare a, a detailed report that will contain a whole, a whole range of figures and, and charts and graphs to explain what it is that we found in our analysis. Our second goal, Chief Bowers mentioned this as well, is to analyze these calls for service um, and particularly on the caller side. Um, so the, the, the research question of interest here is to what degree do uh, people call the Piedmont Police Department about behavior <clears throat> and provide descriptions of, descriptions of suspects um, when that when that behavior is not clearly linked to criminal activity. And we will uh, engage in a, we will use the call data that I just mentioned as a, a primary data source for that analysis, but we'll also make use of other uh, data that we've uh, now obtained from the Piedmont uh, PD. So we have information on re reported crime suspects, for example, from police reports, we have information on arrestees uh, and other kinds of, um, uh, interactions between uh, the Piedmont police and members of the public uh, that we will use to benchmark against those uh, caller descriptions of people um, that are offered when they call the police. Uh, so that's our second goal. Uh, we have 
as I mentioned, already conducted uh, some community focus groups to get a sense from the community about how they perceive um, crime and other problems in Piedmont um, and the extent to which those, those crime related or other kinds of problems are associated with Piedmont residents versus uh, folks that perhaps don't live in Piedmont um, and a variety of other questions that, that um, we obtained information from, from the focus groups. And we will, uh, we're in the process of analyzing those data as we speak as well, and they will be part of our report. We, um, We've collected, as I mentioned, we have now collected uh, five years worth of internal call data and other related data, um, arrestees, crime suspects and, and the like. We've conducted our focus groups. Uh, we recorded those focus groups back in the fall and um, we are analyzing the transcripts of them uh, right now. Um, and those data will provide a lot of context, we hope, and. Um, and meaningful background information to help inform the quantitative analyses that we're doing with the 911 data. We are uh, delayed, our timeline is delayed. Uh, we had hoped to be finished right about now and we are now scheduled to be finished uh, in the late spring. And the reason for that delay is um, because we had some difficulty getting the data uh, out of the 911, out of the CAD system from the vendor, the third party vendor that the city of Piedmont uses for its 911 system. Um, it took a bit, um, quite a bit, a back and forth with this vendor. Um, and special query, uh, SQL queries had to be written. Um, and I think the whole process on their end was much more onerous and took longer than they had, I think, hoped and anticipated. So we, we were delayed three or four months uh, beyond our original timeline, just trying to get the data that we need out of the system. Um, it's actually not an uncommon problem with, with, uh, with CAD data. CAD systems are really good of, of, about taking in information and storing it. Uh, in my experience, and we've worked with many uh, police departments over the years and many sets of CAD data, they're not very good at getting that information back out. And that was the case here in Piedmont. And uh, the third party vendor struggled a bit um, until we were all finally able to get the data from them. Um, and that didn't happen until about the middle of January. Um, so we, um, we have extended the, the, uh, contract or the agreement, uh, with the city of Piedmont until the end of May. And, um, we are shooting, uh, at the very least to hit that deadline, but we hope to actually come in, uh, with our final report sooner than that. Um, so we will, uh, we're, as I said, we're analyzing the data right now. Um, with respect to both of those research questions that uh, I mentioned. And uh, we anticipate wrapping that analysis up where we can sort of begin to construct the, the tables and, and, the, and the text to go into the report uh, sometime in uh, early April. And then by the end of the month, we hope to have a draft report uh, to the city detailing our findings. Uh, we'll give the city some time to review that draft report and get back to us with any feedback or suggestions that they may have. And then we will finalize it, deliver it back to the city as a final report. And then at that point, we will come back to Piedmont and we will present our findings both to city, the city leadership and also to the community. So that's, that's kind of where we stand and um, what the timeline looks like from here on out. So with that, I'll, I'll uh, open it up and we'll, Rob, my colleague and I are happy to take any questions that anyone might have. So John, do we, uh, looks like we have a couple people, uh, hand, at least one hand coming up. So I'll, I'll leave it to you. Yeah, 
Um, I uh, would ask that folks with questions use the Q&A feature in Zoom and type those in um, so we can kind of group them together and see. And we'll just take a second here to wait for that, wait for a question to come in. Um, the first question that has come in is, can we give in, input back to our CAD vendor about the requirement for data extraction and analysis? So I'll, I'll go ahead and answer that uh, question. Um, I think quite a bit of input has been given back to our CAD vendor um, uh, by by several folks throughout this process. Um, if I understand the question right, you know, again, you know, as Dr. Uh, Smith kind of uh, talked about, this is not um, an unusual circumstance with uh, with CAD systems. Um, you know, not I don't want to repeat what he said, but you know, again. Um, inputs are, are generally much, much more simplistic and easier and refined than, than extracting. Um, that said, you know, in the future, should we engage uh, like in an RFP process or select a new vendor or something along those lines going forward? Um, after this experience, I can, I can assure you that that's something that I'll, um, and that we as a city will, will, will um, you know, kind of at least have a conversation about, because clearly I think, um, you know, relative to this project, but certainly uh, as, um, you know, law enforcement and because of legislative changes or just best practices, um, you know, and just, you know, the trend to be ever more transparent and share the data that we have, um, clearly there's going to be a need um, to have better processes in existence to extract that information in a more timely, effective way. So, um, appreciate that question. Um, certainly, we've engaged in that with our current vendor, and and uh, depending upon what the future holds, we'll engage in that with uh, a future one. The next question um, is: Do we have any preliminary conclusions to report or avenues of inquiry that we'll be focused in on? The avenue, the avenues of inquiry are laid out in the in the research design and the research questions that I went over, and so that they, those will be the focus of our analysis. That analysis, analysis is ongoing, and we're not at a point yet where we can share any findings. And I would encourage residents uh, or community members participating. If you do have questions, please go ahead and type them in. I will, I will, let me add one more thing to that, that answer. Um, once, once you get, so five years worth of data is a, is a pretty good chunk, even from a, a, a small city like, like Piedmont. It took a long time to get the data and um, once we did get it. And there's a lot of, um, it didn't necessarily come out cleanly either. It didn't come out the way that ideally, like we would have liked it to come out. And so there's a lot of there's a lot of cleaning and manipulation of the data that has to happen uh, before the data are are ready to be analyzed. Um, and so between the time that we we finally got the data and now that that time has largely been taken up with the cleaning um, and the reorganization of the data and creating new variables and the all kinds of the cause of things you have to do to prep a large data set before you actually begin to analyze it. And that's a, um, because of the nature of the way the data were extracted, it, that was a, that was a, a labor and remains a labor intensive process. Can I just add one, one other quick thing, just in, in terms of the, um, the nature of the process and what you can sort of expect from a report, not in terms of the substance, cause that obviously as Mike just outlined is still, um, you know, being analyzed, but I think what's, what's important. And I think should, you know, the chief and the community should be proud, you know, be happy about to see is that you're, you're going to get an analysis of the empirical reality of what has gone on the last number of years in the, in terms of the police department and their, you know, the calls that they receive. Um, but then you're going to be able to, and I think Mike references contextualize that against, you know, perspective from 
residents that was given to us through the focus group. So it gives us a nice sort of what we might call triangulation or different perspectives on the, on the nature of the topic at hand. Um, and and it'll, it'll be interesting to sort of get a sense of, you know, um, how those two different sort of um, perspectives or, you know, uh, assessments of what's, of what's happening, um, you know, align or, you know, maybe don't or whatever the case may be. And, and that's an empirical question that we'll obviously be able to, you know, address. But I think that will be something that, um, you know, the report will speak to. And I think will be beneficial for the department and the community to, to, to get that sort of multiple perspectives on. And I want to sort of follow up um, with a, a related question. Um, will the final report include insight into how we stack up against comparable or comparable cities and what others have done to address identified issues is the first part of that. And we'll come back with the second. Right. So uh, we, we won't directly compare Piedmont to other cities. That's, that's not part of the scope of work, but, but what we, we are charged with providing the city some recommendations based on the analysis and our findings. And we will certainly do that. There is an emerging body of literature on, the, on these topics that we're, we're engaged with, with you all on. Um, I mentioned the, the project that, that Rob and I did ourselves in San Antonio, uh, where we analyzed, you know, over a million calls uh, to, to the San Antonio Police Department over the period of three years. But there's also since then, since that time, been uh, some recent papers that have, that have come out that have looked at this issue in other cities too, more broadly. Um, and so we will make full use of that literature as well as our own findings in, in the analyses that we've done ourselves to help inform the recommendations that we make. Uh, back to the city, the city of Piedmont. So you can expect to see that, some discussion of that literature and uh, how it may inform our recommendations as well. And, you know, talking about the work that you've done in San Antonio and other cities, um, can you talk a little bit about what the conclusions were that you reached by analyzing data in other cities? Well, I talk briefly briefly about what the literature is showing um, and those, some of those papers that I referenced. Um, you know, it's all, one, of the, one of the, I think one of the key questions that cities are wrestling with um, involves mental health and police response to those that are in, in mental health crisis of one kind or another. And whether or not the police are really the best entity to do that, or whether they are even equipped to do that, um, and whether or not potentially other other agencies, professionals, mental health professionals, uh, paramedics, and so and so forth may may be better equipped or um, should respond in some sort of co-response model. That's a key question that a lot of cities are are dealing with. It's addressed in that body of literature that I mentioned to you. Um, you know, part of the, and I think, I think it's fair to say that there is a best practice emerging around a co-response model. Um, there's a number of cities that have, have had this in place actually for a while, before, before it became really part of the national conversation. Um, there've been a number of cities that have had models like this in place um, and that where those, they, those have been the subject of some analysis and evaluation. And, um, and, and they seem to be, uh, I think there's a broad recognition that the police are the police. They're not mental health professionals. They're very well trained in Piedmont, I know. Um, but by the same token, they're, they're, not, um, they're not counselors, they're not um, psychologists, um, and they're not, they're not specially trained to deal with people in mental health crisis. And so I, I think it's fair to say that there's a, there's a broad recognition within public safety uh, that uh, a co-response model is probably preferable in mental health cases and mental health crisis cases in particular, rather than just sending the police. Um, so for example, in Dallas, um, they have a model that sends a police officer, um, a mental health 
a trained mental health professional um, and a firefighter paramedic uh, as a three person team that respond to um, to mental health related calls when they come in and they just got a grant. In fact, I read about it um, when we're doing some work in Dallas uh, independently of this where um, that will allow them to expand the coverage. So a lot, you know, one of the reasons that the police get called to these kinds of things is because the police are there 24 seven and mental health professionals are not. And it's, and it's, it's expensive um, and, and it typically requires additional staffing to make them available uh, beyond, um, you know, a normal eight or 10 hour day. And so uh, in Dallas, for example, they've, they've gotten uh, some grant money recently that will allow them to do that very thing. The cover, I think 20 of the 24 hours now are going to be able to be covered by uh, with funding to allow for this co-response um, uh, these co-response teams in mental health calls. So if the question is, you know, are, you know, are there best practices out there that are emerging? Yes, there are. And we will talk about those in our report. Uh, we'll give you all some sense for how frequently you, you, your officers respond to mental health calls, for example, um, and what the manpower requirements are to do that, which will help inform this question about if you were to go to a different kind of model, what kind of staffing might be, might be required, you know? Um, so we hope to speak to each, all of those issues um, in, in the report and provide you some, I, we hope something that would be very useful to the city. Rob, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I would just, um, I, I mean, that, that's all 100% on point. And I, I was just, I would add sort of broadly, I think what the, the studies in other places have, have demonstrated to date, there was one out of Philadelphia and another one that used multiple different, I think nine different cities data. Um, you know, one of the, a couple of themes that came out of that is that actually the, the, the percentage of overall calls to the police that involve mental health related concerns or was actually a lot lower than what people I think anticipated or, you know, sort of, you know, believed to be the case until it was empirically sort of evaluated in these places. Um, and that's not to say they're not important because they're often quite serious when they do come in. Um, but it's, but it's not nearly as common, I think, as sort of the, the, the common discussion or vernacular might've thought uh, it to be. So that's one thing. And I think the other thing that, um, that the, the theme that sort of jumps out of this literature is, is the importance of safety. And so when, when you're considering, you know, what, what an agency should or shouldn't respond to and, and how they should respond as Mike suggested in a co-response model or otherwise, um, you know, there is a certain component that there, that the, the safety of the officer and obviously of citizens has to be taken into account and it has to be paramount in making the decision of, of what the response should be and who should respond to a particular call. So, those are just a couple of things I think that the literature is sort of starting to solidify around. And, and again, we'll, we'll be able to sort of speak to those as well here as, as, as Mike alluded to. The next question goes a little bit back to the, the chief's opening remarks, but uh, it, it is, is race and or the perception of race an explicit variable in the analysis? Yeah, as, as with, with respect to the second research question, the answer is yes. So, you know, part of that that question is really centered around, um, you know, are 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 the police being called to respond um, to suspicious circumstances or suspicious persons uh, when the when the callers are describing the individual's um, race or or ethnicity. Um, and and does that work? Is that the nature of those calls um, driving disproportional response or contact? Um, it's an important question, particularly in a, in a city like Piedmont. And uh, that's what we're we've been engaged. One of the things that we've been engaged to to analyze and examine. So to the extent that race plays directly into that question, the answer is yes. And you, you may have addressed this earlier, and I apologize if you did, but will the, the data set that you're using for the analysis be released publicly? So those data belong to you all. They're your data. Um, and we will make the, the our, 
if we're asked if the city would like our data set, then we will absolutely provide it. And the city then will make the decision about whether or not to, be, to release it or in what format to release it. And I would say if there are any other questions that that community members have, please go ahead and put them in the, the box now. So John, one of the things I just want to touch on, and again, if we get a, a couple of questions that trickle in, um, yeah. feel free to interrupt me. Um, it looks like we actually just have one, so I'll, I'll pause. Could you could you again go over the analysis of when the timeline, or pardon me, go over the timeline for the analysis to be complete? We expect to have a draft report to the city by the end of April. And that draft report will be a final, not it will, obviously not a final report, but a fully completed draft that will include all of our analysis. And the city will then have the opportunity to, to read and react to that before we finalize it. So that's the timeline. So again, this, um, this update meeting tonight will be, um, is being recorded and will be available, uh, we'll make it available um, uh, via the city's webpage, um, YouTube channel. Uh, we'll make sure that's out there. So if you have individuals who are interested in this topic um, and you don't feel uh, like trying to remember everything that's been discussed tonight, uh, there will be an opportunity for you to, to, to review this as well um, online. Um, and obviously, you know, the report, um, when it is finalized, uh, we'll obviously make that available to the public as well. Uh, we'll have, you know, obviously a lot of public uh, conversation about it. Um, one of the kind of bigger picture things I just want to call out about this is that once this report's done, you know, really my view of this is it's really the beginning of a conversation, uh, a number of conversations probably really on, on minimally, um, aspects around the two research questions um, where there's a whole host of um, uh, you know different directions that things can go with that in terms of, of you know how we're responding how we allocate resources in our city um, what our staffing looks like um, what types of folks do we have um, to do different types of uh, provide different types of services to our community and the public at large so it will really be the beginning of a conversation uh, but key in that is, again, going to be the empirical evidence and data um, that's going to be, in my opinion, very necessary to make some substantive policy decisions and, and, and other decisions potentially. So um, I think we have another question. Yes, um, this goes back to the to, to two questions we've talked about before, which is um, the question of race, how, do, how are we looking at that? But also, was it looked at in other analysis that you did for other cities? And what were the conclusions drawn in those other locations? So I guess two, two parts to that answer. Um, the body of literature, the, the, the relatively new body of literature that both Dr. Tillier and I referenced around 911 calls and police response the um, the answer is no that uh, those that that body of literature and those paper those recent papers that was not a focus of that of of those that, those particular analyses they were focused more on the types of calls that the police were like our research question one in your in your city um, with respect to have we looked at this sort of question before um, not directly we've looked at my primary and, and Chief Bowers mentioned it at the, at the in his um, much too kind intro about me. My, my primary research interest for 20 years has been the intersection between race and policing. So I have done many, and Dr. Tillier has as well. We've done many studies um, examining disparities in police citizen contacts um, across the a, a whole range of outcomes everything from traffic stops to pedestrian stops to arrests to use of force. Um, that, that has been our sort of bread and butter uh, research expertise for a long time. 
Um, the particular question that's relevant here is a little bit of a twist to that, right? It's a, it's a little bit of a unique, uh, it's one of the things that intrigued us about working with you all um, is the question here is been asked before in certainly in, in policing circles. Um, I, I can't, and I know the literature pretty well, and I can't tell you off the top of my head any study that I know of that has directly examined empirically this particular question. And just sort of at the close here, could you restate those two questions, the, the two questions that you're looking at? I think that would be a good way to, to kind of end just as a reminder. So we have, Two, two, two primary goals, two research questions. We're gonna be analyzing uh, calls for service to the Piedmont Police Department uh, to understand the frequency of calls, the types of calls that come in, police resources that are utilized in responding to those calls, um, and to make some data-driven recommendations on the need for police versus, versus non-police or co-response models. That's the first question. The second question is we will be analyzing calls for service um, to determine the frequency and impact on police operations of calls that lack specific descriptions of crime related behavior, but include descriptions of the potential uh, individual who's being called about the subject of the call. That was back to the question of will race and ethnicity be directly analyzed as part of uh, as part of that particular um, analysis, and the answer is yes. Because um, the, 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 to, put, to put it in more simple terms, perhaps, um, some folks may be familiar with the term racial profiling by proxy. Um, are the police being called to respond and, and therefore disproportionately come in contact with people uh, not because of the decisions that they are necessarily making, but because they are responding to demands from the public. And that's the key question in, in that analysis, and that's what we will focus on. Well, thank you very much for your time this evening. Thank you to the residents for, for joining, and I'll turn it to Chief or Commander if you have any closing remarks. All right. Well, thank you, John. And before I say anything, I'll, I'll uh, afford the opportunity to Commander Douglas. Uh, do you have anything to add, Commander? No? Um, I do not. Right. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so again, I just want to thank everyone uh, for taking the time this evening uh, to check in. There are some great questions. Um, uh, one, one final thing that I would uh, steer um, folks to who are interested is the actual staff report that includes the scope of work um, that was approved by the council. If you go to the city's website, you can navigate um, to that staff report uh, via the city council's webpage. The staff reports are there. The date of the staff report was July 19th of 2021. So if you go to that, if you go to that, um, that section, um, you will be able to, um, to download that staff report and be able to look at, look at all the information um, in terms of the questions uh, that uh, Dr. Smith and Dr. Tillier outlined tonight. Um, again, this is a very important work. Um, I'm, I'm quite frankly very excited about it. I think um, in particular the bias by proxy research question, um, when I hear Dr. Smith talk about, you know, this is fairly new to, to me, that's exciting. To me, that's, we're, we're, you know, we're breaking new ground and new areas of study. Um, and, um, and again, it's all in a march towards, you know, again, better and better policing, more effective uh, policing. Uh, which ultimately uh, benefits us all as a society in terms of um, understanding that public safety is all of our responsibilities and the way that we um, uh, uh, that we put forth that public those public safety efforts those law enforcement efforts with uh, a thoughtful approach um, to be as effective as possible with the limited resources we have um, is is at the end of the day what we're what we're trying to do so uh, appreciate all the efforts of everybody here this evening and looking forward to uh, uh, the completion of the report and the continued dialogue and conversation. Thank you. Thanks again. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you.